recipients of this lectureship, we thank you for Justin and the way in which he has prepared both his life and the lesson for today. Open our hearts that we might apply it to our lives and strengthen us in your service. Through Christ we pray, amen. John Paul, I think you left out the most important part of the story, and those students brought donuts to my office that day. <laughs> students bring me gifts often, and usually it's a sugary food, so I don't know what that says about me, other than I like to eat sweets, but uh, it's great to see all of you here today. If you've been here every session this week, uh, I appreciate your presence, and hopefully something has been said that has spurred you on to think differently about the Word of God or about the passages we've studied. Today we're in Exodus chapter 33, beginning in verse number 17, if you want to be following along in your Bibles. Exodus 33, beginning in verse number 17, as we consider God's revelation to the appointed. We talked about how on uh, Tuesday, this passage illustrates what a number of other passages illustrate, and that is we are authorized to approach the throne of God in prayer with audacity. There is nothing wrong with challenging God, even with being angry with God. The Bible authorizes that, although many people today feel uncomfortable with it. We talked about yesterday how God authorizes us to approach him with anxiety, how we can understand through the study of his word that the Bible encourages us to leave our burdens at uh, the throne of God and allow him to take care of those things. But today we're looking at God's revelation to the appointed. God has always had a special relationship with the blameless. Isn't that true? I love in the book of Job how when the book opens, the Bible features Job as a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil. And we're told as a result of that when the Satan, this role played in the book, shows up and uh, God has this conversation with him, God actually proposes Job as an object of temptation. I wonder how uh, Job might have spoken differently in the book if he had known the content of chapters 1 and 2. Uh, I imagine he would have felt a little bit differently about how and why he was suffering. But it's God who has so much faith in Job that he's willing to put him uh, forth as a subject of temptation. God has always been on the side of the blameless throughout the scriptures. And when we talk about the subject of revelation, that appears even more to be the case. Notice in Hebrews chapter 1, we mentioned this verse just briefly yesterday. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible opens and in the original Greek. It's a beautifully rhetorical opening to a book. Palumaros kai palatropos palai, it says which means in English something like God who at various times and in various ways. And we talked about how that teaches us that in Old Testament times, God communicated his revelation both unclearly and inconsistently. God's revelation was not immediately obvious to his audience, and it wasn't consistent. In fact, I use this illustration in one of my books, uh, over the course of about, of about 100 years of Abraham's life that we can trace, God only speaks to him, as far as we know, eight times. It's not like God is appearing to Abraham every third Tuesday of the month. Or Abraham has a phone number he can dial, you know, dial up a revelation. That's not how it works. God provides Abraham with precious little divine guidance for how he ought to live his life. Now read Romans 4 with that in the back of your mind. How much the more faithful does Abraham appear when we consider how little he knew of God's revelation? We move on to the life of Isaac. And in Genesis 31 and verse 42, God calls himself the fear of Isaac, despite the absence of any revelation of himself to Isaac. You see, people of Old Testament times often had very little information to go on, but they made the most of that revelation and were as faithful to God as they could possibly be. Now that we have God's total revelation, the faith that has been once for all delivered to the saints, how faithful are we? Are we equally engaged in following His word? The inconsistency of God's revelation 
just how faithful they were. But notice there was a lack of clarity to God's revelation oftentimes. When, whenever we hear that, it doesn't sound right because we've been trained to think every time God speaks, it's obvious exactly what he means because we grew up hearing God means what he says and says what he means and there's no way anybody can mess it up. But that's not what God himself actually says. In Numbers chapter 12, for example, verses 6 through 8, and by the way, this passage provides an excellent segue into our context because it represents God describing the special revelation that Moses alone received. How Moses is different because he enjoys a relationship with God that is different. And there are a lot of challenges in this passage, perhaps, but these verses are tremendously <laughs> meaningful. Numbers 12, beginning in verse number 6. And God said, speaking to Aaron and Miriam, who have raised a rebellion against Moses, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. I communicate in visionary formulae. I place an idea in their minds. They can see the word of the Lord as it were. What's the first verse of the book of Isaiah? Anybody remember how that book begins? The vision of Isaiah. People struggle to figure out if we're reading this book, how can it be a vision? Because God communicated it in a vision. God communicated his revelation typically in this fashion. But notice he says, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth clearly <coughs> and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? It's interesting that God himself takes a special interest in this case and descends to defend Moses, his servant. And he says, let me tell you about Moses. He is different in his intimacy. Nobody sees the form of God, but he does. Nobody receives the kind of clear, obvious, explicit revelation, but he does. God's revelation to Moses was exceptional in terms of his typical revelation to human beings because he was special. He was appointed by God for this very specific purpose of providing the backbone of the entire Old Covenant whereby Israel would live leading us unto Jesus Christ. Notice as we go on, I just messed up something here. There we go. I don't know what's happening, so we're forgetting the PowerPoint. Notice in verse number 17 of Exodus 33, God's commendation of Moses. Exodus 33, beginning in verse number 17. The Bible says, And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor, some of your versions may say grace, in my <laughs> sight, and I know you by name. One of the easiest things we can do to help other people is to provide encouragement. Isn't that true? It is really easy to do. Not everyone can stand before an audience and speak equally well. Not everyone can stand before an audience and lead singing equally well. We have heard some prayers this week that are beautiful masterpieces of the use of the English language. Not all of us can pray that way. But anybody can encourage. And as easy as it is, it is a spiritual gift that is often neglected, isn't it? You even hear people provide excuses for why they don't encourage. I've had people say, and some of you who are preachers, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've probably heard this before. Well, I would give you a compliment, but I wouldn't want you to get the big head. How many people have heard that before? Now, I have two problems with that. One is... They are concerned that you're going to allow that compliment to go to your head. But secondly, that's kind of an arrogant statement, isn't it? That my compliment would mean so much to you that it would so inflate your ego that you would be displeasing to God. Don't think about that. 
If you want to encourage somebody, just encourage them. If you want to pat somebody on the back, just pat them on the back. We've had a number of truly phenomenal speakers this week. When I was looking over the program a few months ago, as we were ready to send it off to the printer, uh, the lectureship committee takes a look and we try to avoid making mistakes and things like that. And I was looking over that and I thought, man, this is an incredible lectureship. And it was so, I mean, the speakers and the topics, I just felt like we've, for some reason, I'm so excited to see what we're going to find out of the book of Exodus. I hope you feel that way. I hope you feel like it's been wonderfully enlightening and spiritually enriching and challenging. But the fact is, a lot of times, as well as people do, we just don't give them the encouragement they deserve. Notice how God doesn't let that opportunity go by. The Bible says that he tells Moses, listen, this very thing you've spoken I will do, for you've found favor or grace in my sight. Only three times in the Bible do we read this description. Only three times in the Bible is it explicitly said that a person finds grace in the eyes of God. What's the first one? In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8, the Bible tells us the world is corrupt. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted, some versions say, was sorry that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So what happened? So the Lord God said, I will blot out man whom I've, whom I've created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But, <coughs> what? Noah found grace in the eyes. Noah found grace. Some versions say favor in the eyes of the Lord. The second time it is used in the Bible, it is used of Moses in our passage. The third time it is used of Mary, the mother of Jesus, who has found favor. She is the highly favored one, Luke tells us in Luke chapter 1, in verse number 30. She has found favor or grace with God. When Moses is given this description, you have found grace in my eyes. This is an extremely rare description of God's favor with humanity. But secondly, notice Moses is recognized by name. Many of you have probably gone through the Dale Carnegie system. Uh, maybe you've read his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. One of the principles in that system is this. Remember that a person's name is, to that person, the sweetest and most important sound in any language. One of the things that I tried to do after I learned this is when I'm talking with people, I don't always do this, so if I offend you, I'm sorry, uh, but I've always tried to call them by name multiple times in the conversation. Now, you've got to be careful because if you mess their name up, it's worse. <laughs> because there is nothing more offensive to us than for somebody to get our name wrong. Is that not right? Uh, my name is Justin. Pleased to meet you. Um, people call me Jason a lot. Uh, maybe I look like a Jason. No offense. I like the name, Jason. Glad you're here today. I, I like that name. There's nothing wrong with that name. It's a perfectly fine name. It's a biblical name. I like the name Jason. But guess what? That's not my name. And whenever people call me that, it just, it bothers me a little bit. Has anybody ever been called by the wrong name? Does it bother you just a little bit? When somebody calls you by name, it means something. When they speak your name, it is precious. It is important. Notice God said, Moses, I've called you by name. <coughs> Philip talked about in a chapel today how God speaks from the mountain, you know, Moses. He calls the name of Moses. The creator of the universe thought enough of this man to call him by name. In Isaiah chapter 43, beginning in verse 1, God, who's trying to comfort Israel, who is in distress, says these words. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. The students in the crowd will recognize these words. Maybe not coming from Isaiah 43, but from a song we often sing. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. 
When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. Those words make for a beautiful song, but think about the promise inherent within them. You are my people. I have called you by name. I have bought you. I own you. I have a claim on your life. God is still saying that to us today. We are his people. Not because of what our name is, but because he has placed his holy name upon us. You see, God not only gives us the honor of knowing us and calling us by our names, but he has given us the honor of putting his name on his <coughs> people. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, in verse 14, God says these words, speaking of the nation that would turn its heart to the Lord. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. You think our nation needs to hear those words today? <coughs> If the nation will spread its hands to God, humble itself, and go to him in prayer, I will heal their land. I will provide what they need. I will be their God. So often we see the opposite. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 12, God promises there through his son Jesus, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. I don't apologize for the name Church of Christ. I don't apologize for the name Christian. And the reason why is it is an honor to wear the name of Jesus Christ. And we ought to make sure that we live our lives in accordance with that tremendous honor. God's commendation of Moses was deeply personal. It was meant to reassure him. It was meant to propel him forward through what would not be an easy time as he leads the Israelites into the promised land. But secondly, notice, in order to further reinforce that God reveals himself to the appointed we have verses 18 and 19 describing God's condescension. The Bible says, Moses said, please show me your glory. Now I want you to think about that word glory for a moment. Please show me your glory. In verse 19, and he said, God responds, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. What exactly is Moses asking here? What is his request all about in verse 18? Show me your glory. Well, glory is associated with a number of things, isn't it? When we think of glory, we think of light. When we think of glory, we think about holiness. When we think of glory, we think about magnitude of presence. <coughs> but the fact is that the word itself, the Hebrew word kavod, fundamentally has one meaning, and that is weight. You know, like you load something down with weight. In fact, the verb form literally means to be heavy. There used to be an expression in the 80s. Some of you don't remember this, but others of you will. This is heavy. Anybody remember that? It's a pop cultural expression. You know, this is, this is not a good situation. This is kind of nerve-wracking. This is heavy. Maybe that's a good way to think about what the Bible is saying. God's glory indicates that when God's presence is in a place, it doesn't feel the same. It's heavy. It feels different. It feels awkward. I think of uh, Isaiah whenever he, too, is on, or excuse me, Elijah, when he is on Mount Sinai. And the Bible says that you have all these natural disasters, you know, that happen in succession. And then there's that, what the King James calls that still small voice or that, that eerie calm. That's heavy, isn't it? Whenever there is chaos swirling around, but you have 
total nothingness. That's pretty heavy. And so maybe Moses is saying to God, overwhelm me. Weigh me down with your presence. Just, just smash me in the face so that, I, so that I will feel everything you are completely and totally overwhelm me. Maybe he's asking in pop cultural terms, Lord, show me your gravitas. Show me what makes you so great, so different. In Augustine's confessions, at the beginning of that work in chapter 1, he asks these questions. Who shall grant me to rest in you? Who will grant me that you should reach into my heart and overwhelm it? that my sins may be blotted out and I may embrace you, the one and only good. What are you to me? Be merciful that I may speak. What am I myself to you that you should command me to love you? And if I do not, are angry with me and threaten immense misery. Is it then a small thing if I should not love you? Not to me. Tell me by your mercy, O oh Lord my God, what you are to me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation, so speak that I may hear. Behold, the tears of my heart are before you, O Lord. Open them and say to my soul, I am your salvation. Inspired by this passage, Augustine says, I will run after that voice and I will lay hold on you. Do not hide your face from me. Even if I should die, I would die seeing your face. Have you ever thirsted? for the presence of God like that? Have you ever so desperately wanted God to make himself known and make himself plain that you felt like that? Augustine says in the same passage, our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. But notice God's response in verse 19. He says, I won't allow my glory to pass before you but I will make all my goodness pass before you. We see this and it's puzzling. How do you see goodness? How does goodness pass before anyone? It doesn't seem to make sense. But the expression that is actually used here is a very comparatively rare expression. All my goodness is used elsewhere in the <coughs> Old Testament to indicate an overwhelming profusion of blessing of grace, of unmerited favor. Notice in Deuteronomy 6, verses 10 and 11, there the Bible says, speaking to Israel, and when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of, call to, all goodness, that you did not fill, and cisterns you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, on and on. God is going to overwhelm you with his goodness and grace. He's going to give you things you do not deserve. He's going to give you things you didn't work for. That's what this expression means. In Psalm 34, verses 9 and 10, one more example. The Bible says, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no goodness. Same expression. The fact is that God takes care of all his people, of all those who seek him, of all those who spread their hands to him by providing his goodness. But notice God's condition as well in verses 20 and 21 of Exodus 33. The Bible says, but he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Notice, first of all, God expresses the divine presence. 
Here God is going to appear to Moses in the full glory of his presence in a way that had never been revealed to humanity before will be revealed. And it's a reminder that God's presence is dangerous. We sing about this uh, episode, don't we? You hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. The idea is Moses is going to be tucked away because he cannot look upon the presence of God. He cannot be. He needs to be hidden. He needs to be tucked away so as God's dangerous glory not break out against him. In Exodus 19 and verse 22, the Bible says to Moses, Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break (coughs) out against them. What does that mean? It means that God's presence is so dangerous that if we as human beings are unprepared to enter it, it can mean our certain death. We don't often think about the presence of God in that way. We think about the presence of God as this stream of grace. We think of God, many times in our world, as a big teddy bear who gives out hugs and wants us to give him a hug too. And he's friendly and he's nice and he's kind. Well, that's true, isn't it? In part, but the Lord our God is also a consuming fire. God's presence and glory is also dangerous and threatening. And if human beings throughout Scripture are unprepared to engage Him, it is fatal in the encounter. And to respect that aspect of God's nature is just as scriptural, is just as important as appreciating His love and His mercy and His compassion. You see, I have the privilege of teaching here Old Testament wisdom literature. And one of the major concepts in that kind of literature is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, Proverbs tells us. And people say, well, well, fear doesn't really mean fear. I've heard a number of explanations like that. Fear does not mean fear. What fear really means is reverence or respect. What the Bible is saying is we we should respect God, not that we should fear God. Well, that's again partially true. The Latin church fathers spoke of the mustorium tremendum, the repulsive mystery of God, driving people away, keeping people from approaching his throne because he's too great, he's too mighty, he's too dangerous but also speaking of the mysterium fascinans, that is the attractive mystery of God. What draws us to him? What makes us want to know more about him? In Exodus 14 and verse 31, there the Bible says, Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord. And they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Here we see the miracle of the Red Sea and how God had acted for the salvation of his people. And the Bible tells us they feared the Lord. They worshiped the Lord. In fact, the very next chapter, Exodus 15, it's one big poem worshiping the majesty and greatness and power of God. In that case, the fear of the Lord brought people to wonder in awe at who he is, the attractive mystery of God's almighty presence. But we also find just a few chapters later in Exodus 20, verses 18 and 19, these words. Now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood afar off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Here is the repulsive mystery. We don't want that deep communion with God. We don't want to know him as intimately as he has invited us to know him. We want to keep him at a safe distance so that we don't make a mistake and lose our lives. I think it's healthy to have those images of God in balance. To understand that the fear of the Lord involves both an attraction to God, to know more about him, to be drawn more deeply into the well of his grace and mercy but also a healthy respect, knowing that if we are unprepared to enter his presence, the consequences can be (coughs) devastating. Both are equally scriptural. But secondly, notice the divine protection that God offers to Moses. The principle, God will never give us more than we can handle, applies not only to temptation, it also applies to salvation. 
God has not asked any of us to do that which we are incapable of doing. God's salvation is just as accessible as our freedom from temptation. God gives us what we need, but the devil specializes in convincing us that we need even more than that. God said, this is what you need to do to be saved. But the world tells us, no, that, that's not really it. Maybe, maybe that's not the full picture. Maybe there's more to it. Maybe you need to go through additional requirements. Maybe you need to do things that the Bible doesn't say to do. It's always been interesting to me that it is harder to place membership in some churches than it is to receive salvation from God above. Does that puzzle anybody else? Because they place so many additional requirements that they make life harder on people than the Lord himself. We can appreciate the fact that God gives us exactly what we need. Nothing more, nothing less. Abuna Sidrak once said these words, The devil has convinced us that unless we grasp for what will satisfy us, it will not be given to us by God. That God is not so generous, apparently, as he claims to be. So we fear in our own desperation that we must place our priorities ahead of God's and make our own anxieties and our own neediness greater than our trust in his solitude or his providence. Some of the church fathers speak about spiritual greediness. Think about that concept for a moment. Asking of God more than we need to please him. Sometimes we can be guilty of that. Of demanding of things God of demanding things of God that we really don't need in order to live lives holy and acceptable in his sight. You see, 2 Peter 1 and verse 3 tells us already, his divine power has granted unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. We have everything we need. The scriptures are all sufficient. Not mostly sufficient. All sufficient. God has provided through his word an abiding presence for us in our lives to fill our hearts with everything we need to know, to fill our minds with everything we need to practice, and to live in accordance with his will. And he does that because he always blesses his elect. Amen. If you are in the Lord's church, you are part of that body that was purchased and planned before the foundation of the world, not only to provide a safe atmosphere of brotherhood and fellowship in this life, but an eternal comfort in the next. God has predestined his church to be with him for all eternity. And as so far as Moses surrendered his life to God and lived blamelessly before him, he was part of that group. Moses not only serves as a great law giver, but a permanent example of bold, humble faith, even in the midst of an all-powerful, all-loving God. Amen. The same God you and I still have the honor to serve today. Thank you for being here today and this week. God bless you.